Uh, when Tracy Hayes rang me about this, um, on the other end of the phone, she said, Phil, I've, um, I've heard you speak a few times and every single time I've felt like running outside and slashing my wrists. So if I go to the NTCA board and recommend to them that uh, you may speak at this conference, for God's sake, cheer up a bit and say something positive. <laughs> Tracy, no promises. <laughs> so my brief from Tracy was firstly to um, try to answer the question, uh, are we in a beef price boom or not? Um, and then if we are or, or are not, in any event, we've got more cash or working capital in the system now. Um, how should that be allocated rationally for the best chance of being prosperous in the future? That's, that's probably, in my view, the more important question because um, uh, for every business manager, a CEO of a public company or even back in a beef business, the rational allocation of capital is one of the most important things that you can do. So um, I have to use the laser pointer here and um, I don't know which screen's best to aim at because I can only do one at a time, but I'll, um, I'll do my best with it. Um, there's not much you need to know about me other than this. And uh, I dug out an old family photo that pretty much tells you all you need to know. <laughs> OK, so let's start with the beef price. So <clears throat> I keep the data that you're about to see updated um, every six months or so, and it goes back a fair way. In this case, um, my data set goes back to um, 1949. So there's a, a few things to point out here before we get into the detail. Firstly, those data have, have been expressed up until December 2016. It's a quirk of Excel graphics, that data like that you can't get the last year in. and. Um, so the other thing is that I have taken inflation out of that, and you are looking at that price there in December 2016 dollars. So this is an important principle. Um, if you're looking at data that's more than three, four, five years old, you've got to take inflation out. If you look at it in nominal dollars, you get terribly misled. So that, that uh, graph in nominal dollars would be just going exponential over time. So those, um, those big events, like that one there, they happen about every uh, 70 years or so in agricultural markets. Um, some of you in the room who are as old as me will have lived through that. And as you know, that, that was not pleasant at all. Anyway, we came through it all. Um, I think from there back, is probably now ancient history and not relevant to today. Um, also to point out that this is, um, all the data are expressed in dress weight terms, carcass terms. So if you want to, if you think live weight, just halve those numbers. So this is the average price of all Australian beef. And um, a lot of work went into doing this. And um, so how do you average <coughs> The price of cows, bullocks, steers, cull heifers, bulls, all of that. Um, it's too hard to do it every time you want to get a price point on that. And in fact, when after a lot of analysis and study, the, the best de facto of the average price of all Australian beef across regions and, and across classes of cattle is the Japox price. The Japox price closely approximates it, and you're looking there at the, the Japox price. So I'm now going to, to go contemporary, and I've chosen a 30-year term here. So I'm going back to um, the start of um, uh, 1987, late 1986 through till now, to give me 30 years to try to answer this question. Oh, before I go there, um, I want to point, a point out here that I'm going to try and illustrate in the graph that follows. 
Not many people understand this. So what does EBIT stand for? Earnings before interest and tax. So you've got all your revenue in, you've paid all your operating expenses, what you are left with is EBIT, then the interest and the tax comes out and you're left with net profit after tax. All of our analyses end at EBIT simply because the amount of debt that you want to employ is a discretionary uh, amount and, and so down to EBIT level there's not much discretion in it. So the amount of profit, if you like, before interest and tax in any decade in the beef industry will be generated in three of those ten years and that is true up here and down south. It's also true uh, for wool and wheat as well. Now, this is the critical thing. You've got to capture those three years, and if you don't, they'll pass by your front gate with, without you even knowing. It's really important. So bearing that in mind, and I'll come back to it, let's have a look at the last 30 years of price. There we go. First of all, um, for, the, for most of the time, it's traded in a channel of um, uh, 300 cents to 500 cents dressed or, or $1.50 to $2.50. It drops outside that channel um, occasionally on the low side and uh, on the high side, which it's done now, um, but it's largely in there. So that yellow line is the trend line, the mathematical trend line that runs through those data and it's essentially flat. It's, it's not going anywhere, really. In order, for that, in order for that line to be lifted up to be an increasing trend over time, what's happening now either has to go higher or go on for longer. Now, um, if we go back... You can see that these sorts of events that are happening now with the price, there's nothing new. I mean, look at that there. Look at the, the depth of that fall just there. There's nothing new in that. They've gone up by that much in the past, and they've also fallen by that much. Is this a fundamental change, and are we now in for a new era of prosperity? Maybe. But when you look at those data, uh, the, the answer is probably not. I have got no idea at all where that's going to go, and nor does anybody else. I don't know um, anyone at that point in time, I don't know any screen jockey, um, analyst or anybody else that predicted that that would happen. Nobody. It comes out of the blue and um, that's the way markets work. Now, the final thing before we leave this slide. If you look at it more closely, look at this. We've got a trend that starts there and goes down to there, roughly 10 years. We've got another trend that starts there and goes up to there, roughly 10 years. It changes and the next trend goes from there down to there. A book was written 30 years ago on that called The Cattle Cycle. You'll probably find it on Amazon if you want to read it. But it's been a real function of um, um, the global beef price and particularly in Australia. We haven't got time to go into the causes of why that happens. But it, it partly explains the previous statement. You make 75% or more of your EBIT in a decade in three years. So in that particular decade, if you're starting there as a decade, you'd be making most of your money for the decade there. In the next decade, you'd be making most of your money at the end of it. And in the next decade, you'd be making most of your money at the start of it. Now you have to superimpose over that drought and other issues, that's just the price explanation, but it goes a long way to explaining why that previous statement is true. So um, the answer to that is 
unless your herd is productive, those periods, three or four years or so in any decade of reasonable prices, just pass by the gate and they don't make a heck of a difference to your operation. Um, I, at any given time, I've got no idea what the beef price is. I don't follow it, I don't look at it, I don't know. And if I turn up to somebody's place to, um, to do some work, um, I generally have to ask them what the beef price is. Because to me, it doesn't matter. A rising beef price is like the rising tide. It raises all boats. But within any given year, take any year, between herds, price received is not a profit driver. It's almost irrelevant. The relationship between EBIT and price received is effectively zero in Northern Australia. There's no, it's foolish to chase premium markets. It's, it's a flawed strategy. And so to be preoccupied with the beef price um, uh, is, to me, a complete waste of time and a distraction. The only time I'll get interested is if you've got to sit down and do budgets or some sort of financial analysis, yes, you, you've got to have a look up what it is, but the rest of the time, no, it's, it's a distraction. So that was that line of thinking, which um, you mightn't feel appealing at all, because the, the price is, um, is a terrific subject for social discourse. When, when cockies get together anywhere around Australia, they talk about the price and the weather, and they can't do anything about either of them, so I wonder why they talk about it. Nevertheless, um, that's the case. So I don't want to get distracted by that, so I thought, well, this is way back now, going back nearly 40 years, what is a good model? And um, uh, at, at that time, I got seriously interested in investing and for me it was the share market and uh, I had to come up with a, an operating model for that. And so um, very quickly after some work I realised that it's a complete waste of time looking at what the share market indicator is. It's just noise, there's all sorts of experts predicting what it'll do, none of them get it right consistently over time so forget about it. So once I identified a few good companies, I didn't even bother about the price of them. All I was interested in was what they were worth. What was their intrinsic economic value as a business? And I watched that like a hawk, and still do, right to this day. And I don't worry about the price. Maybe every second month or so I might look at the price and see whether they need to be sold or more of them bought. Otherwise, I'll leave it alone. And I thought, well, that's worked for me pretty well with share investing and continues to do so, why shouldn't I apply that model to a beef business? And I can't see any reason why not. Why not focus on how productive and profitable is this herd and this business and keep a very close eye from year to year on whether the value of that business is going up over time or not? Don't confuse the value of a business with the price. You can go to an agent and they'll give you a price on your herd. They're not giving you a value. You get the price and you can sell it in the market tomorrow and get the dollars in. I'm talking about how capable is this herd of being profitable and is it above the breakup price or not? You've got a breakup price when you sell the herd down, but is the value of this herd as a function of its productive capacity above or below the breakup price. If it's below the breakup price, no chance of improving that. There's really only one option, and that's pretty obvious. So that's my line of thinking on all of this. Um, ask me what the beef price is going to do or what I think of the beef price. Or, I've got no idea. I can make only one accurate statement about the future, and I'll be 100% correct, and that is the price is going to go up and down. That's all I know. And folks, I don't think anyone else knows either. When you look at the track record of all the analysts and screen jockeys, it's woeful. They never get it right. OK, with that perspective, let's carry on. 
So, I don't think we're in a beef price boom. I think those prices you saw on that 30-year graph have probably got to go on for another three or four years before that trend line will be lifted up. Then we can start talking about a boom or otherwise if it's a useful conversation. Um, however, there is certainly more working capital in the system. And that's, to me, the most important question. How do we allocate that rationally and effectively for future prosperity, the theme of this conference? OK, let's have a look. My colleague Ian McLean and I uh, teach the MLA um, Business Edge course that Ian and I put together. And across Northern Australia, we've had over 600 producers go through that course. And in that course, we um, teach, as part of that course, the definition of what a financially uh, sustainable beef business looks like. I need, to, I need to go through this list of eight definitions quickly because some of the things I'll talk about come back and refer to this. So, um, your business return in your business has to exceed the cost of capital. What's the cost of capital? Essentially for a farm um, that's family owned, farm of station, beef business, north or south, it's the cost of debt. And whatever the cost of debt is at the time, your total business return has to exceed that um, otherwise, you are destroying wealth. So, at the moment, if you're thinking of deploying capital um, and your um, business return is uh, less than the cost of debt, it's obvious. One of the first things you've got to throw capital at is debt reduction. Um, so, your operational expenditure. You've just got the normal operational uh, dollars going out and the operational capex that you've got every year. How's that being funded? If it's being funded out of your working account and it's an overdraft and your overdraft never gets into the black, it's always in the red, the bank is partially funding your operating expenses and that's unsustainable in the long run. Owner remuneration. Um, when we are doing any analysis for a husband and wife or male-female partnership team, um, we allocate $140,000 in wages that should be paid um, to the owners um, in any event. So why that? Because that is the total of the average full-time earnings of the average Australian male and female worker. And if the farm business, the station, the herd, can't support that level of owner drawings, um, then it's the owner lifestyle that's propping up the business. Add on to that about $30,000 worth of non-cash benefits from living on site with a rent-free home, fuel, car, phone, all that sort of stuff, and that adds up to about $170,000. And I think that's fair enough. It should be added on because surely your skills in running a beef business are better than the average full-time worker or workers. Um, you've got to be able to pay debt principal. Interest-only loans that go on for more than one or two years are, are disastrous financially. You've got to maintain a safe level of equity. Now, this is um, alarming for most people, but what does safe mean? Um, unless you're, if you've got an average business, unless your uh, level of equity is around 85%, um, the business will be unsustainable in the long run simply because after you've paid that interest out, there's not enough money left over to do all the provisioning for the future, including that. That really costs. If you're going to make it work, it costs a lot of money and it has the potential to break the business and break the family as well if you get it wrong. We'll hear more about that later today. You've got to be able to retire independently and get out of there. The worst thing that can happen in the family operation is for um, mum and dad to move down to the cottage, the young folk move up to the main house, dad goes out on a motorbike with a pair of pliers and a dog and he's happy as Larry. That, that's unsustainable. 
and most importantly, you've got to maintain that. So there's eight points that we think are critical um, to determining whether a, any business in agriculture, but a beef business, is financially sustainable in the long run. So we have got excess cash or working capital in the system now. How are we going to allocate it to all those things? First of all, debt management. Um, think of it in simple terms. Let's say the bank own 40% of your place. You've got 60% equity. So they own 40%. Um, but when you get down to EBIT and you look at the interest you're paying out, and 60% of your EBIT's going out to the bank. So they're 40% owners, but they're getting 60% of your EBIT. Now, if that's the position you're in, there's, there's really no need to think. You've just got to go and get into debt reduction. And if you're down that low, like significantly below 85% in the long term, probably most of your working capital should be allocated to that, provided that the business is profitable enough to justify it. I'm going to put the following thing up because we come across it so often. It is so widespread and pervasive. And it, I'll put it up just to get you to think about it a bit. You believe that? Lots of people do. Now, if you, if you just believe it, it's a sort of a background thought. Um, it's probably just fi financial naivety. If you believe it, uh, to the point where you actively practice it, it is financial illiteracy. The fact is that there are occasions every now and again where it is better to pay interest and in tax, but most of the time that is not true, that statement. So just be aware of that. Interest only loans that go on forever are, are a disaster. Um, the second thing is um, operating scale. Have you got enough AEs under management as a family operation to um, be, be sustainable in the future? So um, all of the data that Ian and I have generated that we used in the Northern Beef Report and from other data sources show that um, below 1,500 AEs, you've got no chance, no chance at all. Um, below 1,500, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So if we're talking um, about uh, how many AEs do you need to run to be stable in the future, well, it depends. How much total EBIT do you need in the business to make it financially sustainable, and how profitable is each AE? There's a table, and um, that that is uh, built on a, a business that is financially sustainable. Now, most people who are striving for financial sustainability are going to be sitting somewhere in there. So it's going to be anywhere between that number of AEs and that number of AEs. But, but look at it, you know. That number of AEs generating that EBIT per AE will be generating that number, just like 20,000 will at that number. Big difference. If you're seriously under scale, um, definitely under 1,500, possibly under 2,000, then overheads are always going to kill you. There won't be enough AEs out there to spread the overhead costs over. So, you know, if you've got... Um, 1,500 or 2,500 AEs, you're still going to need a Toyota. And the cost of that Toyota gets lowered as it's spread over more AEs. Too small, under 1,500, how much do you need? Depends on what your family needs are. Too big. Now, this is a serious issue in, in northern Australian beef operations. Let's, uh, let's talk about that. What do you want? Do you want more of that? What if, um, you know, you're here? It's 
So you want more of it. That's not going to change, but you just want to go up that path there. That's fine. And you'll do more and more of that and nothing much will change with the inherent profitability of the business. So this is where capital allocation comes in. You're the CEO of um, Widgets Proprietary Limited, a public company. And uh, at a board meeting, you suggest to the chairman, uh, I think we should have a rights issue to raise more capital and we'll go out and buy more widget factories, get bigger, but nothing's going to change. Our return on equity is not going to change. Nothing else will change. Cost of production won't go down much. Um, if you did that in that environment, after the board meeting, the chairman would come up and tap you on your shoulder and say, pack your bags and get out, it's all over. But that's what happens a lot up here. There is this mentality that you, if you get bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to get better and better and better. It does to a point. Um, but uh, beyond that point, there's more likelihood that the business deterioration will deteriorate through diseconomies of scale. I'd like to f conclude the session presenting the case for the focus to be on productivity. Um, I think this area is where the dollars are best spent and I'll try to give you some evidence for that as we go. So, if we look at the elements of productivity in a beef business, there are three all up. Here's the first one. Land, how productive is it? Here's the second one. And here's the final one. So the, the evidence is overwhelming that we have addressed that. Over time, labour efficiency has improved on most, in most northern beef businesses. Just look at the number of workers that are around today compared to what used to be there historically. And we've done all sorts of things. Thank God this sort of nonsense is now disappearing. I look at that, not only do I look at that, but I also wonder how could anybody make money out of a herd like that in the background? We, we, it's been easy to do that. It's all transparent. The cost of wages and employment are right there on the books in front of you every day. And the cost of getting good labour gets increasingly difficult. And all sorts of things come out. Better Toyotas, quad bikes, other things, buggies and, and, and choppers and things. So we've made big, big inroads in that area, but it hasn't been forced on, it, on us because the technology to do something about it has been there and it's been evident in the books, it's been transparent. What about land? That, that photo there is a Mulga land system. Now, there are all sorts of Mulga land systems, but that one there is in D condition. It's stuffed. There's no grasses there, nothing. You've just got Mulga, and soil. So A, B and C and D condition are the major descriptors of land condition. If you're looking at buying another station or property somewhere and the bulk of it is um, uh, a mixture of C and D because it's been degraded over time, its economic value is worthless. It's not worth one red cent because it's not productive. So land in sea condition will only produce 25% of the forage on any rainfall event that land in A condition will. The land in A and B condition are much more productive and that extra forage will drive better herd productivity. You get down into C and D and have landscapes dominated by that, um, even if they gave the place to you, um, walk away. It's, it's intrinsically worthless. And unfortunately, there's too much um, of that sort of land around. 
If you go and talk to the experienced and serious rangeland ecologists and some of the CSIRO people, they will tell you that the evidence appears to be accumulating now that Northern Australia is overgrazed and uh, we've got to back off. There's been a bit too much degradation going on. There are ex individual exceptions, but as a broad picture, that's probably correct. Tragedy is people don't recognise the land si uh, situation for what it is. Um, and on the right, which I'll conclude on, is livestock. And I'll, I'll give you more detail on livestock productivity uh, in a moment. But just let me put this up on the, on the, the land and labour first. Here we are on the Barclay. And I put this picture up two years ago at a talk I gave up there. And there were 35 people in the audience, roughly. And I said, um, what's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with it? And none of the audience could find anything wrong at all. And I said, well, what about this scalded country here? And what about all this stuff growing up in this degraded country? What is all that um, reddish Flinders grass doing there? Why is Flinders grass starting to creep in? Why does that landscape look totally different to out there where there's a decent, healthy stand of Mitchell? That's been degraded. And it's been degraded by human management, um, not natural causes. None of, them, none of them saw that, or if they did, they chose to say nothing. The second issue is, how big is that mob? What is it, a couple of hundred head, perhaps? One, two, three, four labour units on 200 head, taking them God knows how far. Why do you need that? And why are these people sitting on those things instead of one of them? That, um, that nearly got me killed saying that. <laughs> In interesting story, actually. Um, the, it, it, obviously, it's a corporate place, but um, uh, the room had quite a lot of young ladies in there, and they were very, very irate. They would have killed me if they could. You can't use anything but horses up here. Motorbikes send the cattle mad. I said, what about laneways? Everyone's invested in laneways? What are they? What good would they do? Um, how long does it take you to ride out to bring that mob together? And so on. It turns out that um, um, the corporate policy now with some of the corporates calls for gender equality in employment. And um, so there's lots of young ladies coming in, which is fine, no problem with that, it's good. The problem is that it tends to attract young ladies who are heavily into the camp drafting scene. And the best way to have to keep their horses fit for camp drafting is to use them for that purpose. And so um, an issue of, say, gender equality is having um, an indirect effect on overall labour efficiency, something that has to be um, resolved sensibly. Let's uh, wind up on this. Um, when when Ian McLean and I wrote the, the Northern Beef Report, uh, we, we had 5,000 individual business sets of data going back for 12 years. So we had quite a big data set from right across Northern Australia, from South East Queensland to the Kimberley. And when we sat down and worked with all that data, we were able to... Um, do some fancy mathematics and come up with uh, an algorithm or an equation that could predict what increased productivity would do to income. And when we came up with that, we back-tested it against all of our own private data and against the data in the Northern Beef Report, and we found it was able to predict productivity with greater than 92% accuracy every time. So, all I can say is you can have some confidence in this. Right, here we are with an existing business. It's 10,000 AEs. And these are the elements of productivity in a beef herd. Those three things 
reproductive rate, mortality rate, and turnoff weight go together to produce the key performance indicator for productivity. How many kilograms of beef is 1AE producing? There's the number. And that, if you put a value on a kilogram of beef, in this case, $2.50 average, there's the income. So every AE is producing $205 worth of income before expenses. Right, we sit down now and set some targets for improvement in productivity. We're going to bump the reproductive rate up from 58 to 68. Very achievable, very not, not too much difficulty in doing that. We're going to try and drop the mortality rate from nine down to four, and we will um, bump the turnoff weight up by 80 kilos. So we do that. What's the outcome going to be? Firstly, how many more kilograms of beef are going to be produced um, under the target model per AE? Here's the answer. What's that going to do to income? There's the answer. All three very simple achievable targets can make that much difference. Over the whole 10,000 AEs, the income per annum increase is a million bucks. Very small changes in the three drivers of herd productivity, very small changes make very big differences. And if you think about it, if you drop the mortality rate, you've got more breeders having more calves that turn off more kilos through sale weight. So you've got a multiplication sign between each of the individual factors. Have a look at that. Let's say your attitude is, this is absolute rubbish. I'm, I'm happy to stay there. That's, it's too hard to do all that stuff. I'm happy to stay there. What have I got to do? What have I got to do to get from there to there with increased scale? I'm just going to buy more country and run more and be happy with that column. Well, you've got to buy a half an AE, haven't you? To get to there, it needs another half an AE to go from 205 up to there. What's an AE area cost? Um, depends where you are. But for the sake of this discussion, Let's suggest that it's pretty unlikely today that you'll get an AE area in most places for less than three grand. If you disagree, then use your number through what I'm going to say. Let's say it's three grand. And so to lift the whole business performance from that up to that, you're going to have to spend 1,500 bucks. OK? Just by doing it with playing the numbers game, which doesn't require any nous whatsoever. How much does it cost to do all those things, to go from there to there? Well, we go back to per AE. You're trying to take an AE, an individual AE, from that sort of profile up to that. So you double the 1,500 back to the 3,000. Is it going to cost 3,000 bucks per AE to do that? Folks, it's not going to cost 10% of that to change the productivity profile per AE over time. All of those three things are inexpensive and easy to change. And the starting point I recommend is that one. That's the easiest one to fix. will give you the biggest bang for your bucks the quickest. This one um, is probably easy to implement, but doesn't deliver the goods like that one will. And that one there takes time. To get from 58 to 68 will take you a bit longer, maybe five, six, seven years. But it's all doable and it's all cheap. And so I, I haven't got too much sympathy for the numbers game where there's no nous involved. You just go out and get more of it and do more of what you've been doing in the past. It seems like a dumb strategy to me. 
All right. So I want to make a serious plea before the, um, the final slide. I think that's true, at least in my experience, and I've seen it in business. And the most, and, and it's going to happen here too. If these prices stay up, it, I'll, it'll happen here for sure. So the last example of this in, um, in Australian agriculture was the lamb price, L-A-M-B, lamb price down south. Seven or eight years ago, the, um, the lamb price rose down there by about the same magnitude as the beef price has gone up here. And for two or three years, lamb producers had significant increases in their EBIT and were doing really well. And then over the next couple of years, the EBIT started to decline back to what it was before the lamb price spike went up, even though the lamb price had remained stable. Why is that? It's dumb capital allocation. Oh, we'll, we'll try a bit more feeding here, or we'll buy one of those new things, or we'll do this and we'll do that, chasing more production without any rigour or discipline in the, in the process. And before you know it, these dollars are being spent in the pursuit of extra production and actually produce nothing, and all they do is add to the expenses and EBIT starts to decline. Now, I'm, I'm saying to you, there's a very real danger that that will happen here too. After a while, you'll start and think, oh, we've got more money now, we can afford to spend it on a few things we've always wanted to try. And if you do that without discipline, um, it could end up bad news. So, here is uh, my plea. Now, productivity isn't everything. Obviously, you've got to You've got to um, do other things, and guys, if mum wants a new kitchen, give her a new kitchen, for God's sake, you know, keep peace in the house. It's not all about the pursuit of profit and efficiency, but you need to be, you need to be disciplined in the area of capital allocation going forward, otherwise prosperity will remain elusive. Um, and to wind up in a manner that will keep Tracy happy and not, we don't go out and slash our wrists. Nothing, nothing from today involves rocket science. There's nothing difficult in, the, in any of it. It, it. it requires you to be better informed. You know, you need to be better informed on being able to read landscape condition you need to be better informed on understanding how to manage that going forward so it either improves or holds its condition. You need to be informed on uh, those three elements of um, production increase in the herd, productivity increase. How do you go about improving reproductive rate in a, in a profitable way? How do you reduce mortality rates cheaply and effectively? How can you add another 80 kilos on so that if this 450 kilogram um, uh, ceiling arrives down the track going up from 350, you can take them up to that on your place cost effectively? How do you do all that stuff? So you've got a bit of work and thinking to do. But if you do that, there's nothing difficult about implementing it. And at the end of the day, um, Ian and I think about this a lot. You know, what makes the difference between people who, who do this stuff properly and those who don't? And it really, it's attitude. It all comes down to that. It doesn't require ability. It's just how you go about it and how you think about it. Anne and folks, I think I'm done. Thank you.